Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. Happy New Year's. Woohoo! Wow, I'm feeling it. 2020 should be a, a, a whopper. Uh, Stacy. Yes, this is our last day of 2019. We're heading into 2020. We have a lot of predictions, that means, because, of course, no beginning of the year is a true beginning of the year without some predictions. I think 2020 could be a year for Giabo. We saw it coming into the end of the year, these uprisings across the world. So will we see pitchforks and billionaire taxes? Jabba was going to have a, a banner year, the global insurrection against banker occupation for sure, because the, the millennials and the Gen Z folks are going to give up. They're going to realize that it's been a rigged game from the beginning. They have no chance. They're not going to make as m much as their parents did. Uh, life expectancy is falling in America, and the environment is collapsing, and they realize they've got to fight their way out of this, or they're going to perish. So they're going to, uh, there's going to be pretty gnarly to use a millennial term. <laughs> I think that was a Generation X term. I remember that Gen from my, okay. <laughs> my childhood. So I think it is indeed a, a time that people in the younger generations, and they have the vote now, they are the millennials, and they have the power. And I think you saw that in the terror this year in the billionaire boomers, because they came out like no other fear I've ever seen on them. We saw Jamie Dimon, Leon Cooperman, Michael Bloomberg, Bill Gates, Lloyd Blankfein, they all came out terrified of this billionaire tax, i.e. the notion, not that a tax might pass, but that the millennials realize that they have some odious wealth. Well, the prevailing sentiment will be that the, bo the billionaire boomers' wealth was not earned, it was stolen. I via the Cantillon effect. By their um, dismantling of the rule of law, by the uh, dismantling of regulations, by their uh, co-opting of the political process, uh, by their engagement in all kinds of nefarious underhanded techniques, they have stolen the future. And now these uh, millennials and Gen Z folks uh, are going to have to act. They are acting. And Ray Dalio, billionaire hedge fund manager out of Connecticut, he, of course, has also ended the year of 2019 with many, many warnings that the pitchforks are coming. He sees the obvious. He's talking like a hedge funder. He's not being, a cre you know, he's not screaming like Leon Cooperman. He's not going on television and crying and saying they're going to take my money. He's just saying, oh. I see what's coming. It's fascism and communism. This always happens every time the wealth and income gaps like this, and like it was in the 19, end of 1920s, 30s. And uh, yeah, I see what's coming. So he sees what's coming. The uprisings around the world were reported by Gary Young in The Guardian. He said something interesting, which I think sets us up for 2020. He said, and so the decade ended as it started with demands for systemic change. Of course, it started after the financial collapse and all those uprisings that we saw in 2010 and 2011, led primarily by the young and hundreds of thousands in the streets of Chile, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Haiti, Peru, Sudan, Lebanon, Israel, Iraq in the U.S. As resistance grows to economic inequality, state repression, bigotry, and sexism, political cultures have become more polarized. With no systemic response to the financial crisis that would prevent it recurring and no punishment for those who caused it, the world sits on the brink of yet another one. There is more oil on the streets and more sparks to ignite them. The next decade promises to be more combustible than the last. Even though the U.S. Uh, doesn't want to admit it, that they have an empire, and it's an empire primarily of debt, that there are some potential disruptions to supply lines. Uh, rare earths, for example, that power a lot of the high-tech uh, economy uh, are in countries and territories that might decide to secede from America's empire, and that, that's going to upset those supply lines. Uh, the oil markets and the oil uh, conflicts, of course, are going to be disruptive to supply lines. The uh, I see that a lot of the... Uh, retail chains that sell extraordinarily cheap stuff to poor people, prices are rising rapidly because of the trade war with China. So uh, as we've said on this show, the poor in America don't notice they're poor because the cost of their stuff when they go to the discount store gets cheaper and cheaper. So their lifestyle never doesn't really get horribly worse because even though they make less money, the cost of stuff gets cheaper. Well, if China and America go to a trade war, the cost of stuff at the local discount store starts going up, and now suddenly you, you really are poor. There is a trade war, and the trade war is ongoing, and it is not stopping, and tariffs are taking effect, and tariffs are taking effect against China. They're taking effect against Europe. So those costs are rising, but as Gary Young points out, there is oil on the streets. 
on the streets where the people are protesting and it's just like one little flame, one thing, whether it's a market crash, whether whether it's yet another bailout for bankers, something is going to ignite it and it's it's all ready to go up in flames is what he's saying. That's what the oil is in the streets is is the anger. It's it's the income gap. It's the more importantly, the wealth gap. And it's the sense that there's an injustice being done upon the people because of the Fed intervening always, always, always. All the central banks around the world intervene on behalf of the bankers. And who intervenes on behalf of the people but the IMF, sticking them with debts and the austerity freaks. So that's what we've seen from uh, through the past 10 years. And there is a sense that despite market all-time highs, despite booming markets, despite the uh, apparent joy for the top 1%, that there is anger ready to ignite. And I think Ray Dalio, as I said, he sees it just as a you know cold-hearted analyst. Uh, you don't become a billionaire being warm-hearted and fuzzy and, and, and hysterical. Again, he's saying that it's all debt fueled, so that there's 200 trillion in debt approximately uh, on the planet. And so if those supply lines are cut, if, if there's a oil on the street, it combusts and suddenly some country is unable to buy U.S. Treasuries anymore, or they go completely de-dollarization, then that uh, means higher interest rates, and then you have a totally de-dollarized, de-globalized world, and it's all against all. That's my next topic, uh, because I have a, on that document I have on your lap, I have QE and negative interest rates. Will they or will, won't they go negative this year? Our guest, Michael Hudson, this past year, he said that rates are going to go as negative as 25 percent if they want to maintain the central bank run system. They will have to take interest rates down to 25 percent negative, he says. Is that going to happen or will the whole system collapse? Uh, will will the basically this generation millennials and Z, will they have to will they tear it down? Otherwise, ne rates are going negative. Well, negative interest rates are an obvious form of financial oppression. So I think that, uh, you know, that T-shirt that, that says the beatings will continue until morale improves, right? So even though you've got billions of people on the streets protesting, they're, because of negative interest rates, they're going to keep going into negative territory to, to try to make the situation better. Because over the past 40 years, their solution to the problem of deflation uh, caused by money printing has always been to print more money. Uh, so they're going to now go into negative interest rates, which just causes more deflation. Uh, and that will, of course, create more social unrest. And But they're not going to stop. The Fed does allege they're going to stop the intervention in the, in the repo market in March. But we know that will continue because the, the bankers control them. They just throw a hissy fit, let the markets crash by 20 points. <laughs> That's the new crash. Remember, it used to be 1,000 points. Now it's just 20 points is a crash. So the other big story I saw from 2019, and I think it's the single biggest story, is that when Mark Carney had said that the dollar's days are numbered and that we have to think of a new settlements layer. So do you think 2020 could be see the first emergence of a viable settlements layer? We have Bitcoin and gold. Gold has historically been the unit of account globally in trade, and then it was displaced by the dollar in 1971. But people seem to be sick and tired of the US dollar, not only from the um, trade imbalances that naturally arise from it, but the fact that it's been weaponized since, well, essentially since 2008 and 2009. So do you see that happening in right. 2020? Right. The, the world will be split between the U.S., Japan, and Israel on one side versus Russia, China, Iran, and Germany on the other side. So that's going to be, that's going to be obvious in 2020. Germany is going to go outside of the U.S. sphere of influence. That's the big swing state. And the settlement layer on that side, the German, China, Russia side, will be outside of the U.S. dollar. That'll be crypto blockchain oriented. They'll settle their own payments. They'll have their own rating agencies. They'll issue their own debt and the U.S. side will struggle. That means the U.S. dollar is no longer the settlement layer, and that removes their exorbitant privilege of the United States to exercise control. So therefore, generally, that would uh, indicate that there's going to be more perhaps military confrontation against China. We're seeing at the end of 2019 a real emergence of the xenophobia against Russia being uh, diverted towards China. So we're seeing a lot of xenophobia towards China. Uh, that could be a conflict. You know, Obama is the one that started it with that Asia pivot. Now we could see military conflict. Our friend Dan Collins has said that could be coming. Um, of course, 
there's another issue that could cause a lot of unrest in America. As far as I could tell right now, it looks like 2020, we're going to see Trump reelected. It's pretty crazy for me to see the U.S. domestically acting like it does internationally all the time. I like coups and overthrow and, and it, it, you know, basically intervening in the electoral process. So I can't see them allowing it to happen that Trump could win. But on the streets, on the street level, you see that there isn't much support for any of the Democratic candidates other than Bernie Sanders. And Bernie Sanders, we know, uh, you know, it was revealed at the end of the year that apparently uh, somebody who knows insider knows that Obama says he will intervene if it looks like Bernie is going to win the nomination. The Democrats aren't going to win. <laughs> so that means Trump wins. Remember, Trump's success is because the Democrats can't seem to get out of their own way, right? Hillary Clinton ran the worst campaign in history, so Trump won. Uh, the Democrats didn't learn anything from that, and they're going to run another equally horrific uh, campaign in 2020, and they'll lose again. You know, Trump is not like uh, the genius politician of history. He's just a guy who happened to be there when the Democrats decided to impale themselves on their own stupidity. Exactly. But, I mean, I, I, his policies are pretty much the same continuation of Obama at, on foreign policy and things like that. Like, I don't even understand what, what the whole thing is. But nevertheless, like, there seems to be some sort of, I guess the conflict emerging, as we said, between the billionaires and the rest of the economy is that... You, you see this, like, preparation for some sort of conflict domestically. So you saw that TV show that got pulled where, uh, you know, they went, uh, like, posh people from New York City went hunting MAGA sorts. Then there was another one, a new series uh, on Amazon Prime, also doing the same thing. Guys wearing red hats are shot at and chased down and hunted down by, you know, social justice warriors. So it's just like... It's a weird, it's a bizarre thing to watch, like, that this is happening. And it's, it seems like it's propaganda getting us all ready for conflict here. And I don't think that's a good thing. So hopefully well, yeah. the millennials will it's be something better. It's the difference between off, off, off Broadway <laughs> and the White House, which is Broadway, right? It's the difference between The Lion King on Broadway starring Donald Trump versus social justice warriors in the woods hunting down MAGA-wearing hats somewhere on 6th Street populated by three audience members. And so finally, let's see the tech unicorns. The tech unicorns were starting to blow up at the end of the year. We saw WeWork uh, basically collapse essentially into nothingness. Soft, SoftBank, which was the big funder of a lot of, uh, of Silicon Valley, is that going to go away? Or will you know Elon Musk take us all to Mars and we'll be rescued from the disaster left? I think we'll here. see more uh, 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 air pockets and eva evaporations, more of these instant vapor. Like an Enron was a great b beginning of this. It just went $80 billion in a day. We work $46 billion, disappeared in a day, essentially. We're going to see a lot more of these multi-billion dollar black holes, I think, in 2020, uh, which is kind of, you know, keep, keep, keep your Keep your eyes open for that. Well, that was jolly good prediction time for 2020. <laughs> I, I enjoyed it. Now it's time to hear from Gerald Salente, the, the best prognosticator and prediction guy in Kingston, New York. <laughs> Don't go away. Happy New Year! Wow, that went by quick. Not quick enough in my view. Anyway, welcome to 2020. And I'm here with Gerald Salente, the Trends Journal maestro, the seer of Kingston, New York, the fastest growing hipster town in America today. The New York Times calls it joyful. The Washington Post, go to Kingston, see Gerald in his live surroundings. It's Gerald, welcome back. Happy New Year's. <laughs> <laughs> well, you recently said in the Kaiser Report, Gerald, that interest rates will go to zero or negative this year in the U.S. What does that mean for the global financial system, which is on a U.S. dollar standard? What are the consequences of the U.S. rates going to zero or negative? Will we see negative interest rates in America in 2020? Gerald Salente. I believe we will because the presidential reality show is going to be heating up and Trump needs a strong economy and a fake strong economy. But nonetheless, and the only way they're going to keep this thing going is with more monetary methadone shot into the system. And as the dollar goes down, then these other currencies aren't in so much trouble because the lower the interest rates, the lower the dollar moves, so it won't hurt all those other foreign currencies because they're going down strong anyway. Right. So the trade wars, especially U.S. and China, but also between the U.S. and the EU, heated up in 2019. 
So is trade wars uh, going to heat up again in 2020? You know, have you, you have said in the past you have currency wars lead to trade wars, lead to hot wars. We're certainly in the trade wars period. Is that going to get more pronounced in 2020, Gerald? The trade war, according to the um, International Monetary Fund, is saying that it only affects about 8% of the global G, 0.8% of the global GDP. So I don't think it's going to have that big an effect. I think it's more of a global slowdown that has nothing to do with the trade wars. For example, look at cost sales in India. India is not involved in a trade war. What are they down? Uh, they were down a couple of months ago, 41%. Look what's going on around the world that doesn't have to do with trade wars. Look what's going on, as I had mentioned, all these hot spots around the world, whether it's Chile, whether it's Bolivia, Colombia, Algeria, Lebanon, Iraq. Spain, France with the yellow vests, one country after another. It has nothing to do with the trade wars. It has more to do with the global economy is slowing down and all of that cheap dough that they pumped into it isn't working anymore. Okay, flash round. Are any of these coming back in 2020? Bell bottom pants? Uh, maybe. Yo-yos. We got yo-yos and every politician out there is a yo-yo, so they're not going anywhere. New Bell cuisine. <laughs> yes. Okay, you've heard it here first. Now, let's move on. Any hot wars on the horizon? Hot wars in 2020, where are the hot spots? China, the, Japan, looking hot and dicey. What's going on? The hottest spot is the United States against Venezuela and uh, Iran. Those are the hot spots. And if things break out in Iran, it'll be the beginning of World War III. And, you know, listen to what uh, Einstein said. I don't know how World War III will be fought, but I know World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. So the... United States, Saudi Arabia, Israel's going after Iran, and it's economic warfare that the United States has committed against Iran with these sanctions. The same thing with Venezuela. Those are the real hot spots. And by the way, with Venezuela and what's going on now with uh, in South America with Chile and El Salvador, and Nicaragua and Honduras and all these uh, uh, Colombia, Bolivia, with all these hot spots heating up, and Venezuela going down. You can, if you can have a war breaking out in, in South America as well, you know, that's going to expand and go north. So this thing is really big and it's going to get much worse. A human wave of people are going to be leaving countries around the world, as I said, to escape violence, corruption, war and poverty. What about China with the economy uh, finally crashed? Uh, people have waiting for a debt apocalypse there for the past decade, it never happens. China, what are your thoughts? Well, China's held back a lot on pumping more cheap money into the system. They're doing a little bit at a time, and I think they're going to continue to do it. They're going to escalate doing it because of the problems going on in Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong is now in a recession, and this is the, this is the hub, the banking hub of Asia, and China needs it. So this is really hurting China a lot. So I believe China is going to dump all the dough they can into the system this year to keep propping up, but I don't think it's going to work. And you're going to see a great devaluation of the currency, the yuan, and they're going to blame it on the trade war. It'll have nothing to do with that because, as you already know, was China's GDP is at 30-year lows. The numbers keep coming in on imports and exports, and they keep going down. Again. They've overbuilt. Look at the look at how they expanded in such a short time. In 1996, they had the grand total of 900 billion dollars in debt. Today, they have over 40 trillion dollars in debt and a debt to GDP ratio of over 300 percent. So they're going to do all they can to prompt this up. I don't think it's going to work. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned Hong Kong, uh, the finance hub of Asia, and also London is really the finance hub of Europe. Both uh, undergoing you know, political upheavals with Brexit and all the protests going on in Hong Kong. So where does the finance hub go or does it become completely distributed and decentralized? Are we entering into a period of many, a multiplicity of currencies arising with cryptocurrencies and local currencies in Kingston, there's a local currency now. Um, are we moving away from the big centralized financial centers that have been really characteristic of the last century, two centuries? But you mentioned about it being in, you know, independent. You know all these movements I just talked about? Who's the leader of any of them? None. They're all independent movements. And that's the same thing you're going to start seeing. Globalization is breaking down and it's all going to become independent, like you were just saying. There isn't going to be the centralized, this is the bank, this is the system. Again, 
put the global nomic connection together. All of these riots and all of these protests are going on without a leader. They're independent. And that's what you're going to see more. That's what people want. They want their independence. And you, I think you really nailed it with the banking system. You know, it's kind of weird is that uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. And, but it seemed to, the, the baton seemed to be picked up by America. America oh. became very Soviet-like oh, yeah. in the last 10 or 15 years with the interest rate policies d dictated by the Politburo and manipulating price to zero or negative interest rates or price fixing. Jamie Dimon caught racketeering by manipulating the price of gold. A and they, they hate the free market. They hate price discovery. They hate capitalism. They, you know, you have now um, the leader of the free world in America acting like Khrushchev. And meanwhile, in Russia, Putin is more like Eisenhower. He's out there building roads, building bridges, and building in the economy. They learned their lesson in Russia. They don't want to go back to the Soviet Union. Why did America have, they decide that, you know what? The Soviet Union was actually the model for us. That's the way we're going. What happened? What, why are they doing this? I think Orwell predicted it. He said that the liberals would become the next fascists. And that's what you have, it's a fascist government. It's the merger of state and corporate powers. And you mentioned about Jamie Dimon manipulating gold prices. They don't want gold prices to go up because it shows <clears throat> the valuelessness of what they have. Okay, you talk about trends, you talk about Orwell, we talk about Aldous Huxley, who did Brave New World. And these are two dystopian novels from the previous century that are considered classics. Orwell had kind of a Soviet-like centralization. Uh, Huxley had uh, manip had a centralization based on the mass hallucination, like you see with social media. That was the, uh, he used Soma, was the drug that everyone took to become uh, per perpetually in imbibed and in hallucinating. Um, but are we, it seems like we have a combination of both. We have both the Soma of social media with the dictatorship of the liberal fascists. Is that a fair characterization? I think it's perfect. And look, look how they brag about how artificial intelligence and all of this, a whole internet world created by the geeks is going to lift us higher. Look how much lower we've gotten. And we haven't gone up, we've gone lower with it. Everybody's addicted. I don't carry a cell phone. You know, I did research on this going back to 1994 when I worked for the Cellular Telecommunications Industry Association. And I knew about radio frequency radiation and all the dangers of it. People are addicted to them. And you're seeing more and more people living on sound bites. They're not looking at the current events following future trends, they're getting a little, little sound bites. So the mentality is going down, so too are the lifestyles and the cultures. Oh, look, the new report that just came out in the United States, how heart attacks are rising so dramatically. I wonder why. Oh, because it couldn't be because of the obesity rates and the overweight and all the junk food that people are eating. So look at how we've gone down since the internet's gone up. Oh, and they keep bragging about artificial intelligence. Great. Maybe as good as artificial flavors, huh? Yeah, how about the passion of the soul? How about the spirit of the heart? No, 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 we don't have any of that, and we'll prove it, because nothing's changed from Steve Jobs to Zuckerberg. The only thing that's changed, the T-shirts went from black to blue. You know, the artificial intelligence and the algorithms that drive the social media platforms are, in their words, nudging us. Uh, to click on that ad, to click on that like, uh, to uh, be part of the crowd, and to view those advertisements. And um, this is in China taken to a, an extreme where they, on their five-year uh, conferences where they plan out, they are giving more and more to artificial intelligence. So ch the entire economy is being artificially intelligently planned, and everyone gets a social score. If you spit on the street, you can't get a loan. If you use, uh, you insult the president, you are uh, can't get a uh, your passport's canceled. Is that going to go global in 2020? Are we all going to be basically subjected to this type of uh, social scoring on a day, minute by minute basis? It's going to increase far beyond what we could ever imagine, and it's going to get worse because we're forecasting a global revolution as we're already seeing all these protests that I mentioned going on around the world. So in order to bring down these protests, in order to control them, they're going to put more and more pressure on us to own every piece of our mind, body, and spirit and watch everything that we're doing and control us in every way. It's going to be a real war against the people, against the militarized governments that are going to become more and more militarized and high-tech to control the people. So uh, finally, let's talk uh, U.S. presidential politics. Uh, what are your thoughts on 2020, uh, Gerald Talente? Well, as it stands now, 
if the election were held, we believe that uh, Donald Trump will win again. And in the Trends Journal, again, was the first magazine to re call him a winner in May of 2016. It's all about the swing states. And if you have, if you have a Elizabeth Warren or a Bernie Sanders or even a Biden, they're not going to take the swing states. Again, only if the, if the economy doesn't crash, because there are wild cards out there and anything can happen. And there's no wilder card than the Trump card. But as it stands now, we would say Trump 2020. All right. Thanks so much for being on the New Year's segment of this Kaiser Report. Gerald Salante. And Happy New Year's. Woo! Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> <laughs> Off to a great start. Yeah, if you want to drunk tweet us, uh, it's Kaiser Report. If you want to accidentally send us the private keys to a million Bitcoin, <laughs> it's uh, look at the uh, address down underneath your screen. Until next time, bye, y'all.